Welcome back to Between the Levees. I am joined today by Darren Chambers. He is the logistics manager at MG Transport in New Orleans. The last time I saw him was actually in the Superdome. Darren, good morning to you. Morning, brother. How are we? Doing just great. Welcome to the show. So Thanks. if you've se- if you've seen these before, my friend, uh, you know how they begin. Tell me, where did it all start for you? Where were you born? I was born in Jim Wells County, Texas. Um, a long time ago. And uh, moved to Louisiana when I was two. And uh, grew up in a town of uh, Baker, Louisiana. What prompted the move? I'm not sure. Work, I'm guessing, for my dad. My dad worked for uh, LMB Bank. He was the uh, supervisor over all of the maintenance uh, over there. And the... Uh, he, Dealt with the, the air conditioning and refrigeration a lot for them. And he stayed, he was with LB until the day he retired over on Corporate Boulevard, which is now what Chase Bank. Did your mom work? Now, uh, a little bit here and there, there was a true value uh, there in Baker that she worked at a little bit. And, uh, but that, I think that's maybe because she wanted things and she wanted to have her own money or something like that. And, uh, Put in a couple hours over there, but that was about it. Other than that, she was just my mom. That was plenty enough, I think. What um, were you drawn to anything in school growing up? I was in band. Uh, band played tuba in the in the marching band there. Um, third best in East Baton Rouge Parish. Um, that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I didn't I didn't care for well, yeah, I played baseball, but I didn't play baseball for the school because every time you saw the baseball team at school, they were always raking the field. So. I played the uh, the local Breck League there because we spent more time playing baseball than we did raking the field. What was uh, what was life growing up in Baker? Baker was pretty quiet. You could, I mean, when I was in elementary school, White Hills Elementary is at the end of our road. And when I say the end of our road, I want to say it's probably three miles. And I would ride my bike to school, and uh, from the, you know, probably from the fourth or fifth grade, I rode my bike to school. No worries. Didn't have to worry about anything. And uh, Baker Middle was a little bit further away. Um, but still, it was a quiet town. Didn't get a whole lot of crazy stuff going on. And uh, it was, like I said, it's pretty quiet. It's pretty cool. Not a lot of action. It wasn't a whole lot of hustle or bustle. Did you attend college? No. Well, I did for a little bit when I was at AEP. Uh, put in a few semesters over there. But when I graduated, um, I really had my uh, two things. Had my hopes on going to Florida, marching in the Gators band. And I also had my daughter was born right after I graduated. So those two things kind of not getting accepted that are not getting an application for a scholarship to go there and Dara being born kind of changed directions. Oh, what led you, I guess, what happened after high school then? You have a child, and then what what happens next? I graduated in June. Dara was born in October and uh, worked local stuff here and there. And uh, Dara's mother had a friend, Paris, that knew Paris Arnold, who was the um, HR guy for Carline. And um, set up an interview over there with them and you know, said, hey, this is hard work. I just think you, this is something that you want to do. And I'm like, yep, this is what we're going to we'll give it a shot. And that's how it started. What did you do for Carlisle? Uh, September 12th of 1989, I got on the Palmetto State at Petro United in Sunshine, Louisiana. And that started my decking career there. And uh, stayed on the deck for probably two or three years. And we were spotting a barge at Cosmar there in Geismar, and it had been raining. And when we threw the lines up onto the barge, the guy that was helping me threw the lines into the drip pans. They had a containment area around both engines and the drip pan, and that was full of water. And there was something in that water, and I got acid burns on my hands. And uh, after that, they you know, going to the doctors, got everything fixed as possibly as good as we could get it fixed. I went into, uh, moved off the boats 
CSS Atlanta was my last boat I rode for them. And then I went to the office in uh, the purchasing part and uh, kicked it around in there and then moved up into the dis dispatch department there. All right. Well, tell me about uh, your first time getting on deck. Had you ever seen a, a tugboat before? No, I hadn't seen a tugboat before. Didn't even know that these things existed. And uh, get on there and we if you ever get on a tugboat for your first time, you want that boat to be doing something. We did not crank that boat for four days. And you, if you want to talk about the most boring, the most, I mean, because I, you know, I didn't bring a book. I, you know, I didn't know what to expect or anything like that. So there was no, nothing to, nothing to read or anything like that. And you can only mop the floor so many times. And uh, we just sat there and, you know, basically you just cooked and, you know, you washed the dishes and then you just, there was a TV, <clears throat> but there, you know, we didn't have any movies or anything like that. And um, when I take that back, there wasn't a TV in the galley of this boat. The only TV was in the wheelhouse with the captain. And, uh, but that was a, a rough four days of getting started. Well, tell me about your first run once y'all got cranked up. The first run was made to Baton Rouge, went up there and picked up six loads. And um, it was me, another green guy um, that was out of the Coast Guard, and JoJo was our lead deckhand that we had. And um, I can remember the I was on front watch with Chuck. The Coast Guard guy was on the back watch with a fellow by the name of Ricky Barnes. And this fella had just gotten married and Ricky tormented this guy, asked him if he knew who Jody was. And if I think if anybody's ever been on the boat, they know who Jody is and tormented this guy about Jody. And of course, back then there's no cell phone. So you're not calling home to check on, to see who, who, what or where the wife is. And um, we get to Baton Rouge stop and take on fuel and I can remember when I got woke up from watch they told me that the guy as soon as they hit the dock he was gone he hit the bricks and uh so it was just me and Jojo on the boat and uh that's the way it stayed for the first two weeks that I was on there and um and it was exactly kind of funny because they made bets when at the, after my 14 days on whether or not I was gonna come back you know <clears throat> seven days off seven days that thursday i was back at the office so all the ones that bet against me lost well for the sake of the folks outside the industry tell me a little bit about jody jody is the fella whenever you're on the boat that comes around knocking on the back door talking to your wife or girlfriend and uh drinks all your beer sometimes he leaves beer there but uh it's not the kind that you drink and uh, right about the time it's time for you to get off the boat, he sneaks back out the back door. That bastard. <laughs> All right. So uh, I guess, how did your, your career advance on deck? Were you on deck for three years before you got hurt, you said? Yes, yes. Uh, there was this, they didn't really have lead men or anything like that. You, um, If the captain liked you, you would stay on that boat. And, you know, sometimes... If you were the person that could cook, you were on the front watch because you had to make, you made lunch. And if, you know, the back watch guys made breakfast. So even if you could barely cook, you could throw together breakfast, you know, and, uh, but that's the way it usually was. And, you know, you, you, you get green guys on there, the green guys, depending on how many there were, would dictate how you worked on the boat. If you were, if they put, Two call uh, green guys on there, you would go on call watch. So you worked with both of them to train them up. But if not, you know, you were the front watch or back watch, depending on how well you were liked by the captain. All right. So uh, what hitch were you working? Was it 14 and 7 or 14 and 14? Well, at 14 and 7 was what you, was the basic watch hitch that you worked. But if you wanted to make any, you know, extra money, you needed to work a, a 21 and 7 schedule. So I pretty much stuck with that 21 and seven schedule, sometimes 28 and 14, but you know, 14 days was just too, too long. 
you know, if you back then, whenever you got off the boat, you went, you got a little crazy whenever you got off the boat. So you needed to come back. So the never could make it to 14 days. So 21 and seven was the place to be. I know you said you had a little, a little child. Uh, were you married at the time? No, no, never got married to Tina married now. Um, but was with her for, I don't know, for a long time and, uh, never got married. And, um, separated split up from her and met my current wife nicole um she actually worked at the grocery store where we got groceries for the boats and i was in there a lot and uh just started chatting her up and uh that's my that's my usual saying whenever you know my my daughter or one of the friends or one of the nephews you know is is doing the oh woe is me and i'll tell them you're just searching at the wrong grocery store got to get to the right grocery store yeah well uh as a deckhand how, how was that pretty tough on home life that no. schedule no, no? sir it, 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 it wasn't for it, it wasn't for me i didn't have a problem with um uh, you know being away for those uh the two weeks or three weeks that i worked um the work isn't that hard um it's hard when you first get out there especially if you're not ready to to lift a ratchet and carry a wire and, you know, build toe and move, um, you know, depending on where you are, you could, I mean, there's, you can move a hundred sets of rigging in a day, you know, build and tow. And uh, so once, once you get past that, then it's a cakewalk, you know, it's just basically, you know, the hardest part about being on a boat is the people, you know, cause not everybody's like you and I, you know, you get different people from different strokes. They were raised up differently. And so just um, being able to get along with the people that you work with um, was probably the hardest or the easiest thing that you had to do. Because if you had a crew that, that didn't jail right, they, they could make your 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 days on the boat was kind of miserable. Did you run into any issues with captains or anything along the way? And any, any goofy pranks played on you? No, 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 no issues with captains. Uh, I, I remember uh, Denny was talking about the captain on the CSS Atlanta. That was Larry Dizitel. And that was just when you first met Larry, he always came across as an asshole. And but he wasn't, you know, once you got to know him and or you got to working with him. And that was just a persona that he put off that he was just that he was that captain and he was the captain and he wanted you to know he was the captain. And uh, so he had to put that persona out there on the front end just so you would know. And, uh, but he was actually a really nice guy. Uh, Chuck Arnold was the first captain that I worked with and he was ex Navy. And uh, one of the things that we did on his boat was he hated having bowlings in his lines. All of his lines had to be spliced and the tails had to be braided back together and taped up so that was like a sunday ritual that we had was to get on the stern of the boat and he had a, a certain size that he wanted to roll the wires up so if the wires weren't rolled up right we'd have to stretch all the wires out roll the wires back up we didn't he didn't like to fold them because you can tuck the eyes underneath he didn't like to do that he liked to use cow tails off of uh you know you get those off of uh cotton lines or you know trash lines and he wanted his, the, he wanted them tied up. And then we would run the ratchets out and he would make this, this goo with oil and uh, grease. And we would paint the threads on the ratchets and we would run those ratchets out, paint them up, run them back in. And uh, the lines, we would cut the bowlings out and you had to cut the bowling in a certain spot. Because if you cut the bowling in the wrong spot, you lose about this much line. But if you cut it in the right spot, you lose about, you know, about that much line. So you had to learn to cut the bowling in the right spot. So those things, you know, teach you how to splice a line and you get to be pretty good at it, which is kind of important when working on the boats, um, how to tie things off. And so he was a really good captain to learn from <clears throat> with those things, you know, rolling eyes and wires and stuff like that. He was he was really helpful when it came to teaching you those basic things that you needed to to get through the day. All right. So you get hurt. Uh, how long was re recovery with that that acid burns? 
it, that right there was was a kind of a crazy thing. Um, never really went away. <clears throat> the problem was that um, after that day, went to a couple different doctors, dermatologist doctors, and um, that was the acid burn things is what they came up with. And um, the lines and the dirt or the water and the chemicals that we messed with just never, I, my hands never got along with it. And uh, so it was one of these things that it was going to continuously be a problem. So that's how I'm just, you know, gravitated from the boat to the office. Well, walk me through your uh, <clears throat> your time in the office with Carline. The office was uh, in the purchasing department, uh, getting, it was purchasing and running the cruise around. So the getting the orders from the boats, putting all their orders together for the things that they needed. If they didn't have them in the stock room that we had, had to order them. Um, <clears throat> getting their grocery orders, getting their grocery orders put together and uh, crew change, running crews around wherever they needed to go to all the boats. And um, if anybody got hurt or anything like that, go get them, bring them to the doctor and, uh, you know, basically anything like that. If they were short a deckhand in a fleet, I still had to bring clothes to work every day. So if a deckhand didn't show up or a captain didn't show up, or they started getting real busy in the fleet, Captain Smitty and I would go get on the, one of the fleet boats, the extra fleet boats that was at the dock, and we would go help out and fill the deck. <clears throat> and then move from the there, started working nights at for dispatch, and um, they worked a kind of crazy schedule. It was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and... Um, Monday, Monday through Thursday, and then they would switch over and somebody had to work Friday through the weekend, you know, so they had the, the day guys and the night guys, and then that was the schedule they had until, you know, we kind of started, we kept pressing for the seven on, seven off schedule, and um, Fred Parks had to do a, a little searching around and figured out that that was actually the way that everybody worked, but he made us work eight and six instead of seven on and seven off because it was uh it, it it didn't seem right in his eyes for the the amount of days that we had off versus the amount of days that we worked so we worked eight and six for a, a long time and then they finally switched us over to seven seven and um <clears throat> we just had an opening in the uh the daytime spot and smitty asked me if i wanted to switch over and i told him yeah and uh and that's how I started on the in the day watch over there. Walk me through a day in the life of a dispatcher. Well, <clears throat> show up five o'clock in the morning, and you get your pass down book and everything that's left over from the night before. You get your pass downs, what you've done, take that out, and you you lay out your day on the things that you needed to do. And uh, you know, the, before Smitty got to work, Smitty got to work at three thirty, four o'clock every morning. And uh, <clears throat> so the night before, they would always get where the positions, positions of the boats, and then you would just play out the day till, you know, what you needed to do for the boats to get them from point A to point B. And then there at Geismer, there's a set of docks there, five or six of them, that you, we were the only fleet around. So, you know, we were the, you take calls from those docks and you're moving your the barges to and from and uh everything was handwritten back then there was no computer system and uh so that was the the billing they had a set of specific set of papers that we had for each fleet and if you did a move for that fleet you made sure you wrote that down and that's how you kept up with everything there <clears throat> at the end of the day set your pass downs up for the the crew that's coming on run off copies for the how many ever's uh, needs them and uh, get everything ready for the night crew coming on. And how long did you do that with Carline? That was a long time. Um, so it was Carline and working days till 90, 92, 97, sorry, 97. And then I went to National Marine 
and uh, was the daytime dispatcher over there and then moved into the logistics manager position there. And then uh, ACBL came in and scooped them up and I went to work for Zito as the uh, fleet manager over there for a little while. And that is um, coming from a, a place where, you know, like I said, there's different personalities and there's uh, everybody does things different. Zito definitely did things different. And uh, with their shipyard and because uh, the shipyard was the most important thing that you had going on so at, at Zito. So above and beyond everything else, the shipyard took priority over everything. Whereas in every place else, it was just the opposite. It was the docks and the boats and and uh, line boats that may have been in um, there. And uh, so that was a little bit different to get, you know, get used to that structure. And then uh, Smitty, called me up again and said that they needed help at uh, back at Carline. And so, you know, coerced me into moving back that way, which was, you know, driving to Geismer from Gonzales and driving to New Orleans from Gonzales. You know, that was a, that was a, that's a, that's a big, that was a big thing. So that was an easy switch there and uh, stayed there till I think it was about, 2005, 2000, yep, somewhere up in that that range, and then I moved over to Memco from there, which was Elmwood. It was actually Elmwood is what I started with. And where were you based with that job? That is at the uh, James Business Park, um, right by right by your own airline heading towards the airport. It's right before the airport, right before you go over the bridge to the airport. There's that uh, the industrial plex complex on the left-hand side on airline highway i know what you're talking about okay all right so uh i guess how did your career develop from with memco well with elmwood that was uh that, that was a uh, that was fun times um there the the dispatch position uh work in the day spot um and you know what was funny it was the horror stories going in to that about how busy it was and how you never got a chance to eat and the phone never stopped. And I mean, just, it was one of these things that would, you know, after you're thinking about it, it might make you second guess, you know, what the heck am I going over here for? And uh, got there and sat down in a chair and it was the exact opposite of that. You know, was it busy? Yes. But was it bad? No. And uh, the people that you got to work with, the, the Joe Wards, uh, the Linda Finns and the Trudy Bernard, um, they made made it pretty pleasant to be there during the day. And um, you had to, the, the of course, Elmwood was owned by Memco, and uh, they had a computer system there. And uh, we had a, a giant board where we kept the fleet, fleet picture at, you know, with magnets. So... You would uh, have to cut the, you know, the make the models out like you did for at AEP and uh, keep them on the board for the boats that were coming down and set up the fleet. And uh, but the dispatch ran the fleet there. You know, the boats didn't do anything unless we directed them to do it. So you were heavily involved in how the fleet was set up and how the day went every day. And uh, the same thing with the at nights. The night dispatcher wasn't just a night dispatcher. He was the guy who ran the fleet. And uh, so he was more or less the lead boat there, dispatch was. And um, so that was kind of challenging. And if you didn't know, you know, where you needed to put a barge, you know, based on what you were doing with that barge to set up the fleet. So logistically, it worked out for everybody during the day. And wh which fleets were they that y'all operated? We were at Convent Fleet and the Dockside Fleet. We were, my, I only worked at the Convent Fleet. Lyndon Trudy ran Dockside. And um, so that's, uh, what is that, mile 150, 160 on the uh, lower miss. And then 
we picked up Belmont some years later from uh, ACBO and uh, built that lead up and um, moved out. So we, we came up with it. There was a, we needed a turn fleet. So everything that came in on a line boat went down below to Belmont. And then everything that was for ships or the empty stayed up at the upper fleet. And is that where you first met Kenny? Met who? Kenny Crapel. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, when we were working, we work in Memco. He worked nights. And um and uh, on the opposite watch of me with Greg Guyon and uh met him there. And um and then whenever I moved into the manager's position, whenever Terrence took over the the office, the logistics part of the uh Elmwood side. And I moved into the day spot, Monday through Friday spot. Kenny moved up to day. So Kenny got Kenny and I got to work together, you know, almost every day. And eventually at some point you moved, uh, I know when, when the building and convent was uh, constructed. Yes, after Katrina, because after, after Katrina, the hardest part was we couldn't, you didn't know where anybody was at. And uh, so there was no call in saying hey you know this is darren i'm going to tim's house for the the hurricane and that's where i'm going to be and uh so if you need me you can call me there it wasn't anything like that so you didn't know and you, we didn't know where any of the employees were um unless you could call st louis if you had a phone phones were working you could call them and say, hey, I'm here. But that was the hardest part um, about that uh, after Hurricane Katrina, not knowing where anybody was at. We got the office built in the convent across the street from the fleet. And uh, so that's what that's what prompted that build. So that, that facility there is supposed to be able to withstand a, a Category 3 hurricane. And so you had the, the dormitories in the back that could house people and so there wasn't a question if, if you needed a place to go and you still needed to be able to keep your the office running, you, you had the means to do that. So we moved from the Elmwood um, office to the office in Convent. And under whose ownership at that point? AEP. So that was... It was uh, Yes, American Electric Power owned us then. So Amber and I, after Hurricane Katrina, actually the day after I called Amber Palmer and she was in Maine. And I told her, I was like, hey, switch your flight up to St. Louis and I'll meet you up there. I'm going to leave tomorrow. So Katrina wasn't bad for me. I actually cut my grass you know, the day before I left, you know, so Katrina didn't, didn't really do anything to, as far as Gonzalez went, uh, we didn't have any, any real issues. Um, so Amber flew into St. Louis and I flew into St. Louis and we set up shop up there and Amber and I were in St. Louis for, uh, probably a, either a month or maybe a little bit more than a month. I believe it was up there until they got everything put together back at Elmwood, you know, because there was no water. You couldn't drink the water, um, you know, so driving was just chaos, you know, down there. So we were up there till everybody, till everything got situated back down in New Orleans. What was Amber's role with the company? Amber was, she was the, um, the dispatcher, seven on seven off dispatcher. Whenever I, because we hired her, uh, whenever I moved over into the manager position. Uh, what led you to Gonzalez originally? Nicole. Okay. So, Easy enough. Yeah, well, the working, you know, I lived in Baton Rouge with my sister. And um, whenever Nicole and I got married, we just, you know, we had property out here. Her parents had property right there by Santa Monica High School. So cleared the property off you know, put our house there and, and we stayed there till 2010. All right. Well, tell me about the transition from Memco to AEP. 
that, that was pretty much seamless, you know, because the you, you other than well, the the things that you had the uh, shortly after the uh, the transition, we we got a new computer system, so I was able to work with Cornerstone Solutions in creating the bar jobs program that was supposed to be the fleet program used for our fleets. Um, Turn Services use that and that uses that now. Um, UBT uses it. St. John Fleet uses it. And um, so it was pretty cool getting to work on that from the ground up on the, the ins and outs and how to color the barges and everything that we do to mimic because the goal was to get rid of the whiteboard for whatever reason the some of the upper management just really just thought that was an eyesore you know when they walked in it would be like I thought we were getting rid of that all the time every time they would come in and uh, so that was the reason why the fleet picture was done the way it was done was so that you could mimic everything that we did but put it on a computer screen and uh, it never happened. The whiteboard, you know, that, that was one of the things. Uh, Kenny was really fond of that whiteboard. And uh, that was what that, if you'd have taken that thing down, dude, it would have been a struggle for, for him during the day. And it was easier uh, keeping up with the, with the board versus keeping up with the fleet picture on the computer. Because technically the boats were supposed to keep up with the, the the fleet picture for the computer. That never happened. You know, that was a struggle in itself. You know, because you got the guys working on the boats. They may or may not know how to run a computer. Um, you know, because you know, that's not what they were paid to do, you know, originally. You know, they were paid to run boats. They weren't paid to operate a computer. Well, I was with AEP about six months before ACBL acquired them. That fight about that board was still going on at that point. <laughs> I can only imagine. But, so I know uh, you parted ways with AEP five years or so before I joined them. Um, what happened with your career thereafter? Marquette. Went over to Marquette. My friend Kiefer Bailey was the manager over the logistics department. And um, it was right the, the transition for they were making a bunch of changes in St. Louis and uh, stuff like that. And it's the, the, the offer that he made was, was, a, was nice. And so it, it was a change of pace. So I switched over to Marquette and worked over there until 2015, 2015, 2016. I was there from 2010 to 2016. What did you do for them? Um, I was the one of the logistics managers that they have. You were sales and logistics over there. So um, there was me, Ken, uh, Ken Shuley, and Tom Fisher, and Harris Diano. So basically, you had your week that you were in the barrel, as we would call it, and uh, you were in charge of all the boats. And you would set up there day in and day out for the week that you were on call. You were in charge of all the logistics for the boats. And then the other three guys basically were the sales part. You were going out and selling Marquette, you know, having lunch with customers and stuff like that. And um, and just, you know, people that did that needed to know who Marquette was. So that, that, that was a, a pretty good, if you liked the sales aspect of it, that was, that fit right, fit the mold. And how'd you do in that role? I I didn't think I did that bad. I thought it was it was a it was a pretty easy that was another pretty easy gig. You had to you know you had a good backup system when you have a uh, the Ken Shuley and the Tom Fisher sitting behind you. Um, it kind of makes everything um, easier. So if they if they see you stumbling, they're not going to let you stumble. They would they were quick to to be there to catch you to to not to let you fall and you know vice versa because if you would see that you know Ken or Tom was struggling with something. You know, you just jump right in there. So it makes it really easy um, whenever you have some a team that works together like that because there was some fishing trips that we did with Ben Long and um, where I would take customers fishing 
and uh, we would do an inside fishing trip and then we would do an offshore fishing trip and I was in charge of all of the cooking and um, so those were some some pretty cool things and but Ken would always make sure you know you know because it came up a couple times where it fell on my week to work and Ken was like no bro there's no way I'm cooking I'm not getting up at four o'clock in the morning and cooking food and all this other kind of stuff for for these people so they you know you need to make sure this is your thing and so Ken would always jump in and uh you know work for me so I can make go do the the customer stuff and uh so those were good times with with Ben LeBlanc well, and then what happened uh 2016 forward 2016 um I got the the company took a different direction moved into a different direction and uh we were in we already had a, a, a vacation plan for my son's birthday, which is in November the, the 16th. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, the uh, the 9th. And uh, his birthday's on the 11th. And um, in Gatlinburg, and if you go back to that time, there were some forest fires in Gatlinburg. And uh, so we're up there, you know, doing our thing. And, you know, we noticed that it's kind of smoky outside but we knew there was you know the forest fires were going on and uh there was a lady outside walking her dog the power had gone out but it was in the 30s so it wasn't like we were hot we weren't cold it, you know we, we weren't we weren't in any peril at that time and uh so there's a lady outside walking her dog my wife goes outside nicole goes outside and she's like hey come take a look at this and you go out there and it was like it was almost like it was shut out fall there was so much smoke. <clears throat> and I looked up, I can remember looking up at the cabins where the cabins were above us. And I could see the orange flickering in the smoke. I actually thought that those cabins were already on fire up there. So I didn't say anything. I just told Nicole, I was like, hey, let's get Gage. We'll go ride down to Pigeon Forge and um, we'll go watch a movie or something. Because it was still pretty early. We'll go catch a movie. They'll get all of this worked out and they probably have the power back on before we get back. No sweat. So we're packing some clothes. I go and put Gage in the, in the truck. And uh, when I came back, before I did that, I went out on the balcony and I could see fire. I mean, just as, you know, from that distance, you know, it looked like a piece of fire at about that. And I go pick Gage up, go to the truck, put Gage in his car seat. When I came back out on the balcony, for as far as you could see in any direction, everything was covered in flames. So I told Nicole, I said, we've got, we've got to go, and we've got to go now. Well, <clears throat> when she made the turn, she knocked a cup over off the table that was full of water from supper. And for my plug for croc flip-flops. So I had my croc flip-flops on that were probably 10 years old. And, and when I made a turn, I slipped and sat on my foot and tore my quad completely away from my knee. And, uh, and one thing I didn't know at the time, I know it now, that if your quad's not hooked up to your knee, your leg doesn't work. So, pull a chair up, stand up, and still didn't have a clue what I had done, and go to take a step forward and hit the deck again. And that chair beat, he, that chair beat my ass until I hit the floor. Because the next day I was bruised, I mean, all down the right side. I can remember Nicole come running up the stairs. What are you doing back on the floor? And I'm like, my leg does not work. And she's like, well, you need to get up. I'm like, I'm not getting up. It hurts too much to get up. I'm laying right here on this floor. You engage, go do y'all's thing. I'll be right here when y'all get back. And so finally, she, she talked me into getting up and uh, got into the, the truck, driving down the hill. And when we got to the bottom of the mountain, the fire was right there. And it was close enough to us that I could feel the heat through the door of the truck and drove into Gatlinburg or into Pigeon Forge 
And the, the reason why the fire was uh, spreading so fast was the wind. Winds were blowing like 60 miles an hour, just blowing flames everywhere. And it started by kids lighting books of matches and throwing them out the window is how the fire started. And uh, so we ended up in a, the hospital, x-rays, whatever. And then we ended back up in a hotel that night and got back in the room probably about four o'clock in the morning. And at about five o'clock, the tornado alarms and sirens started going off. And I remember looking at my phone and then the phone basically said, there's a tornado where you're at, seek shelter. And I looked over at Nicole, she looked at her phone, put her phone back on a nightstand and rolled over. And I was like, all right, I guess this is the way we're gonna do it. And so we rolled back over and went to sleep. And uh, and you could definitely, in the morning when you woke up, you could look and see where that ter- that her, uh, tornado passed and uh, ended up finishing the vacation one-legged and uh, got on a plane, came back home, got a call from Celtic. And after that, worked at Celtic for a brief period. Not, not a pleasant um, experience there but neither here nor there, and decided after that, decided, you know what, to take a break from the river. Had a friend that worked at uh, Ralph Sellers, the car dealership in Gonzales, and uh, him and I were shooting the bull one day, and he called me up and, and said, hey, why don't you come over here and do this with us? You know, you, the hours aren't the greatest, he says, but he says, this would be no, no problem for you, and he says, you can make decent money doing it so I'm like okay I'll give it a shot and uh so that's what I was going to do I was going to sell cars and uh worked over there for a minute the you would work you would walk probably somewhere between 20 and thou, 20 and 30,000 steps a day walking that lot and uh so one day whenever I was walking across the showroom floor All right. Yeah. You know, the walk in the lot at the car dealership would be 20 to 30,000 steps a day. So one day I was walking across the showroom floor and the, the reconstructive surgery that I had on to attach my quad back cut loose. It, 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 it ripped away again. And uh, so after that, the, the, the walking part became a, an issue there. And uh, I have to say my, my saving grace on that was a, a phone call. I got a call from Amber. Amber asking me and saying, hey, do you know, do you remember this guy? And I was like, yeah, I remember that guy. I gave him the, the, you know, the nickel tour around the AEP office when he was there. And she's like, yeah, I think, you know, I think he passed away. And I was like, well, if there's one person that'll know, it'll be Terrence. So I uh, switch over and give Terrence Gomez a call. And, uh, you know, we're sitting there shooting a bull and he's like, he, you know, he tells me, yeah, that, that actually happened. And uh, I'm like, dang, he's like, well, D, what are you doing? I'm like working with Ralph Sellers. And, uh, and he's like, is that, is that where you want to be? And, and I was like, well, and he's like, well, D, just come see me Wednesday. I was like, okay. And, uh, give him a go see him Wednesday we sit in the office and we talk and uh, tells me what they have going on I drive to Metairie and um, go and uh, sit there you know we talk for a couple hours in the in the conference room and uh, went back to work that day and put him gave him a notice and uh, started with MG then as the uh, you know just a regular old dispatcher and uh, was me Toll and Chris Woods Cole McDaniels and Chris Woods and myself uh, working and uh, started there and uh, ended up having surgery to put my leg back together again. So in just the, the day in life at, at MG, it, it was kind of different because they don't own boats. There's just barges. So there's just a barge line. And, um, you know, so the some of the ins and outs uh, getting uh learning the rules of the road working there 
the one thing I can say, um, you know, growing up and having a teacher like Smitty Smith and uh, at Carline and um, and teaching you the ins and outs and the the little things that you can do to, you know, make a little bit of extra money. And uh, because it's actually things that you did that, you know, you know, you had to do these things to get the job ready. So therefore you should be paid for these things. So learning these little, uh, I always, I always tell people that I was trained by the biggest thief on the river. And I was like, you know, and I, when he first told me that as a young guy, and I was like, whatever, man always just talking junk and uh but after a while you you think about those things whenever you're putting a job together and you're like that kind of works and or the you know it, at AP being able to work with Mark Stoppel and uh learning the do's and don'ts and uh how to you know present these things or what may be the best way to go about doing the job I'm really thankful that I have those people uh, to work with, um, you know, the the Denny Palmers when it comes to build and tow. And, uh, you know, I can remember calling Denny and asking, hey, you know, am I gonna be a, am I gonna be a, too long on boxes? I need to make sure I've got enough units. And Denny explaining to me, you know, this is what you gotta do. As long as you have this, you're good to go, you know, or, you know, calling Denny when he was on the boat and asking him, you know, questions about a tow that I was uh, I'm fixing to give them or where something was at. And uh, if, I'm, if I'm trying to put together the job and Mike Duncan, um, same thing with the with fleet work or, you know, trying to do something with a boat, having these people, you know, that you can call. And you look back on it now and you're so grateful that you had those people in your life so that you were able to learn and, uh, you know, you're, you're able to learn and you're able to pass this stuff along because, you know, my saying was, is I want you to be however good I am. I want you to be that good or better. And I'm not doing it. I'm doing it for selfish reasons, too. I want you to be that good. So I don't have to keep telling you how to do something. I want you to be able to do it for yourself. So that's the reason why I'm teaching you these things. So, I mean, those, those, having those kind of people to look back on, make you can, especially when you get older, you're thankful that you have those people, you know, the, the Terrence Gomez that, you know, that makes the phone call and uh, still helpful, you know, day in and day out. Uh, he'll come walk by the, the the pit and uh he'll kind of throw some things out he'll he'll throw some uh some mortars out and just keep on walking by and he'll be yeah, that's a pretty good idea and uh sometimes you're scratching your head with some of those mortars he throws out too like is it yeah thinking you uh, know but uh having those people around you currently and in the past definitely mold you to be you know good people yeah. What kind of influence has Terrence had on your, your, your life and career? Well, I've been with that dude for a, a, a minute and, uh, the, you know, the, the work ethic and, you know, wanting to, he used to always say, you got to run it like you own it. So you, you don't really, you know, as a, when I first started as a fleet manager, you know, you don't really understand those things, you know, cause I don't own this, and I, I didn't really know what he meant. But you know, you know, now I do, and you you really do have to take that kind of mentality because if it was, you know, you think about everything you do. That if this was if this money that you're fixing to spend was coming out of your pocket, is this what you would do? And if the answer is yes, you know, that's a simple, you know, simple. We're gonna we're gonna book the job. But if it's something that you gotta think about. But you might want to think about it. So, you know, instilling those kind of, you know, things to how you go about your day and um, thinking about those things all the time with everything that you do when it comes to MG really helps you 
make the right decision for the company and for everybody working around you. Oh, well, I guess tell me a little bit about the details of the, of the career at MG. I know you're a uh, logistics manager now. Did it start out that yeah. way? It, no, it was, uh, like I said, it was Toll, Chris, and I. And um, we pretty much flopped around on who did what, uh, the canal or the river. And, um, you know, I handled the river for the most part and all of the ship loadings. And, um, you know, which did turn to, we have what we call a future booking sheet that has everything, of course, in the future that we have to do. We kept up with that. Uh, the projection, uh, would do the projection and, uh, just kept the boats going and you work, you were on call every third week. And, um, we worked it kind of that way until toll retired. And after toll retired, you know, Terrence called me in the conference room again and asked me if I wanted to be the, the manager and, uh, told him yes, that I would do it. And, um, we, of course that, when Toll left, that gave us a spot. We had Daryl Pochier, I believe his name was, uh, for a little bit. And Ken Shuley had the uh, had gotten the same conversation at Marquette that I got. And so he was available. So we made a phone call for him and swapped out Daryl for Ken, which is probably one of the best things that we've done. And uh, so managing the logistics department and you're you're not doing you're making sure that it's getting done it's pretty much what you do there so you know they're you know you're there in the weeds you know doing their thing and then you have to fly a little bit higher than that and maybe look out a little further than they do to uh see things that are coming at you so you can tell them hey we got this oh, I, can't. I forgot about that for instance you know so it's it's a it's a bouncing you have sounding board you know same thing with terrence throwing mortars my mortars are different the mortars that i throw out are different than the one terrence is throwing out. well tell me a little bit about your your family what are the kids up to these days well i have uh dara is, is what there's fixing to be 34 i think it is and uh she has two sons and uh and then i have gage uh, Nicole and I got married in, in 95 and uh, I told Nicole, I was 25 years old and I, I told Nicole, I said, look, I mean, we're having kids, 30, that's a wrap. After 30, you know, it'll just be dogs. 30 gets here and it goes by and I'm like, Nicole, I'm not playing. You know, we need to, we need to figure this out. And I can remember I'm 38 years old, we're driving down the road and I'm like, ah, what are you telling your mom and dad? Because you're an only child. You know, there's nobody else but you. And she looked away. And I'm like, you're telling them that it's me that doesn't want to have kids. Because I had, we had Dara and we had my nephew lived with us from the time he was 12 until he was grown. And, uh, and I'm like, dirty name. I'm like, okay, I guess that's, we'll just keep dogs. I'm good with dogs. And then her dad got sick and uh, that changed the tune a little bit. So in uh, 2011, we had Gage and uh, 11 years old now. And uh, the day is wake up in the morning. And we got boat stuff. And then we're either in karate or Krav Maga for five days, six days a week, Monday through Saturday. And so it's Mondays, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we're at Krav Maga. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, we're at Karate. And uh, in August, he's supposed to be taking his uh, test to get his black belt in Karate. And then we'll lay off of Karate for a minute, and then we'll just strictly go with the uh, Krav Maga stuff. So every day is pretty much consumed, you know, the evening times are consumed with him. Well, finally, I guess, do you have any... Uh... Uh, any any more words of wisdom for your career in the in, in the maritime industry? No, I just you know the words of wisdom are just thanks, thanks to the people that you know. Like I said, whenever I was with them, I didn't really think that they were helping. I thought they were just being a pain in my ass. 
but turns out now that you need to keep those people close and just, you know, maybe take some notes on what they're telling you, because I can promise you one day down the road, you're going to need some of those words of wisdom that they gave. Well, Darren, thank you for your time this morning, my friend. Thank you, brother. I'm glad you had me. We'll keep in touch.